My name is Bill Tatro. I think that August 8th will be memorable to me for many, many reasons, but I'd, I'd like to go back to August 7th for a second because that was a day which was called Waiver Day. We had started school. The teachers had to be there the week before. We were there for a few days. But on that day, we were given an opportunity to kind of reacquaint ourselves with the Lahaina Luna campus. Remember, an extremely old campus in the 1800s. And we were shown the, the borders, where the borders lived. And then we were taken downtown in the afternoon to go to the Restoration Society building, an old 100-year-old building, and listen to the history of Lahaina. Fortuitous, the day before the fire. And then we were shown in the back room all of the artifacts. I saw the artifacts that will never be seen again. They were carvings from Kamehameha, from the queen, feathers, uh, weapons. I mean, just so many things in the back room. I woke up the next morning on Tuesday, ready to go to school. It was freshman day. The winds were just incredible, running, looked like 40, 50 mile an hour winds and maybe even greater. We had no power. My wife was up country. She was visiting friends, so I was there by myself. But I called, a, with, I had some cell. I called uh, one of the teachers and she says, no, we've canceled school today. Okay, canceled, the school's been canceled. So I stayed there and uh, stayed in my house. Uh, I was reading, I ate a few things. I didn't have any electricity, but I ate in the grill. And as the day progressed, all of a sudden, late afternoon, actually in the morning, I started seeing smoke. But it was, it was south of us. And as the day progressed, the smoke was getting more intense. About 2.30 in the afternoon, I looked out my front window. I had been taking a nap, doing a little reading, and I look out and the cars are bumper to bumper in my, right in front of my house. They were moving slowly and I outlawed to one guy I saw and I said, what's going on? He says, we're evacuating. I said, evacuating? I didn't hear any siren. I haven't been told that. He says, no, everybody's kind of just spreading the word. We're evacuating, we're getting out. So I said, okay. So I went upstairs, it's a two-story uh, house in uh, our particular area. I looked out my office window and that's basically where I was staying and, and looking. And I saw smoke again, getting, getting worse. And as the day progressed, we got to about six o'clock in the afternoon. And I decided just to kind of tool around the neighborhood to see what's going on. And because as uh, about 5, 5.30, I started seeing embers the, the, the wind continued to, to it actually got worse. It was getting worse, but these embers were coming. I decided at that point to, I don't know, play amateur fireman. I took my hose, I sprayed down my roof. I'm thinking if embers are gonna land on my roof, then I wanna spray that, that roof. And I sprayed my neighbor's roof. This was about six o'clock, 6.15, 5.30 to six o'clock. And I got in my car and started driving around the neighborhood and all of a sudden, because there was nobody there, I saw trees that had fallen and I'm seeing embers. And in the bushes, there's smoke coming in these bushes, little, not flames, but just smoke coming out of the bushes. About 6.30, quarter seven, I got back to my house from that little tour in the neighborhood and my neighbor's house across the street, all of a sudden his bushes not only were smoking, but there was flames coming up. He had a hose, I knew where it was. I went over, I grabbed the hose, and I put the fire out. At that moment in time, it's now about uh, 6.30, 20, 27, starting to get dark. A police officer comes down. He says, what are you doing here? And I said, I'm putting a fire out. What's it look like? And he goes, look, we evacuated the neighborhood. I said, when did you evacuate? I saw cars leave, but I saw, I heard no siren. Uh, nobody, I heard nothing. Uh, he said, well, we used a bullhorn and we let everybody know. And I said, well, I didn't hear it inside. He says, well, you stay at your own risk. Okay. So again, I'm looking and I go up to my top roof or top to the second floor and I look at my office and I'm looking and all of a sudden now the smoke changed. It was black. And I learned later that there was a, I guess a building up there that was housing uh, tires and the tires, and I imagine the, the death coming out of burning tires, people inhaling that. My eyes started watering and I started feeling it. And then I started seeing smoke to the left. I started seeing smoke more to the north. I said, you know, Let's see, okay, I'm not stupid, but I went downstairs and I said, let's see if it's gonna be away from me. Should I stay? 
uh, stay with my hose and I went out in the front yard and this is now about 7.30, 20 minute, 20 of eight or so, quarter of eight. And I'm looking down the street and I saw a house that wasn't just a little bit on fire. I mean, at the end of our street, this house was just engulfed in flames. I said, it's time to leave. I got in my car and I just have to tell you that from there to where I ended up is basically a haze, is a haze because I went down the north end of Front Street, the ultimate end of Front Street. And I know a lot of people were on Front Street, but there virtually was no cars at my end of Front Street. And I went and I got up into the main highway. I drove down into, uh, went into the parking lot in the Hyatt and I basically fell asleep in one of the uh, parking, uh, parking areas for beach access. Two o'clock in the morning, a knock on my window. A woman says, we are evacuating the Hyatt. The fire is coming down by the, uh, by the post office. It's on the other side, but it could jump over. We want everybody to leave. Didn't have to tell me twice. I woke up, I started my car, came back up into the highway, and I went up to Napili, and I ended up sleeping that night in McDonald's. I had no cell service. My wife hadn't heard from me for 24 hours, and uh, difficult to get cell service the next day, and they were blocking off uh, getting to the other side, which meant to go be with my wife. My wife didn't hear from me for basically 48 hours. Ultimately, when I got there, I finally came to where she was staying. And as I went up, I got probably 150 text messages finally came through. The question is about a lot of various issues that are being skirted. Why weren't, why weren't the, the alarms sounded? They had been tested on August 1st. They were retested on August 2nd. We were apologized to and saying, well, sorry, it was a mistake. We just wanted to test the alarm and it was a mistake. We tested it again. And yet six days later, they don't sound the alarm. I think given the situation, school was canceled on that Tuesday. Kids were left home. People say, well, you're, I, I read a, a, a tweet, somebody, and somebody said, actually the parents leave their kids at home when there's no school. Yeah, they go to work. We're talking about young kids. We're talking about uh, intermediate school kids, high school kids. They're there with auntie or grandma, and they didn't know what's coming. So there's no siren. And that's with all the people who are missing. I, it pains me as a teacher at Lahaina Luna that probably the majority of them are going to end up being students. They're going to end up being kids because they were the ones that were home. They weren't alerted. Nobody went knocking door to door and, and saying, get out, get out. Where were the police in that? As far as, as, far as um, water, when I pulled out of my home and I pulled onto Front Street to get up to the main highway, right across sitting at the entranceway to Baby Beach was a fire truck. And there were five firemen sitting there. I pulled up and I said, hey guys, there's a fire, there's a house on fire at the end. Aren't you guys supposed to go put it out? This is what I got. Four guys looked at me and the fifth guy goes. Now all I can take from that is not that they were abrogating their responsibility. I would never say that. But once I, I learned later, they had no water. So what are they gonna do? If they take their truck down and, and, and wave at it? I mean, there's, they have no water. The water was shut off. So that's the second thing. You're blocking Front Street, and I've talked to enough people. A friend of mine, who's another teacher, is alive today. He's alive today because he had a truck. He lived in his truck near the banyan tree. He broke through one of the blockades because people see two police officers standing there and some cones behind them they're going to respect what the police officers are doing. Alex was smart enough to know, forget this, and he just drove right at the police officers. If I hit you, I hit you, get out of the way. No cones are gonna stop me. He's alive today because of that. And there are many who are dead, and that has to be, that question has to be answered. Why were people blockaded? Why were they kept in one particular area? Uh, the, the death toll is the, 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 the devastating. And people from the mainland say, I don't understand it. I'm looking at the pictures, which 
unless you're here, you don't get the full feel of it. But there's so many cars in the one area. Why are there so many cars? And cars going in one direction and cars going in another direction. And they're all like behind each other. Why is that? That doesn't make any sense. No, it doesn't make any sense. And I think those questions have to be, have to be answered. Um, it just, just so many things. And as we continue on, um, it's, it's, somebody's feet are gonna have to be held to the fire. The initial fire started with the wind and a down pole. And the fact that, that uh, Hawaiian Electric did not turn off the electric is, is uh, I don't wanna say it's criminal. I'll let the courts decide that because there are lawsuits already against Hawaiian Electric. But it is just, to me, unconscionable because you have uh, this 60, 70 mile an hour winds, you have all this dry grass because it's drought situation and you don't turn the electrical off, that's crazy. But here's the thing that, that I, I've just been, been coming to the conclusion. They said the both, and I can't, I can't, I can't, don't wanna be quoted on this, I'm not sure if it was the police that said this or the fire department said this. The original fire, maybe the fire, maybe the fire department, the original fire that started this whole thing in the morning they were told, they said it was under control. They had it under control. Okay, does that mean it's out? Because many of the neighbors have stated the fire department left and the fire resuscitated or whatever the word is, came back. They hadn't put this thing out. They probably looked at it and I mean, it just is amazing and if they had water, uh, the, the, the tree that was be, where these five guys were sitting, there was a palm tree that was behind them that was on fire. And uh, just a little spray. I mean, if I'm taking my little hose and I'm spraying my roof and I see some, some flecks that are coming, come down they because of the water, what are these guys gonna do? That's that, a siren. People aren't stupid. I heard what the guy said. He said, uh, let's see, if we did the siren, everybody knows it's for tsunami. And they would head into the fire. Really? Really? You really believe that? I, I, I don't believe that. But, but then the final thing is to, to blockade both ends and to not allow people to move, forcing them to get out of their cars and go into the ocean, I just think is unconscionable. And I just, I, I'll tell you, it, it's my anger is, is so that I, as my wife says, I have to control my anger on this whole thing. Because um, one thing happening, second thing happening or not happening, uh, maybe coincidental, but all of a sudden, the, I'm gonna say this, the conspiracy theorists are gonna have a field day. And I'm having a hard time not believing in that direction. There's so much red tape that's going on. Um, I was contacted two weeks ago. I'm a displaced person, okay? Um, I can't get back into my home. Uh, Airbnb and uh, uh, some national organization is, my wife and I are gonna be put up for you know, 10 or 14 days. Very nice, okay? Um, that's great, but then what happens after that? I don't know, okay? Um, but I was asked by the United Way, um, okay, you're part of the zone and that fire zone and like that, you can apply for $1,000. That's great, I'll go through the whole thing. I did exactly what they wanted. That was two weeks ago, okay? That was two weeks ago. And I contacted them this morning. Oh, we're getting there, we're working on it, okay? It's like, it's like national media, it's like um, the government, it's like onto other things. And that's what scares the heck out of me. I'd, scare, I'd say it scares the hell out of me, but I uh, might have to edit that. So, no, it, it just, it is it's unfathomable to me. You know, I, I, was thinking, I was thinking about this. We got, we're gonna have thousands of people displaced. Where are they gonna live? What are they gonna do? I mean, where are they gonna sleep, okay? And it's, it's the world is coming together to help everybody for a week or two maybe a month. And then it's like, it's like uh, President Biden, on to the next thing.
gave you my five hours, saved my Corvette, and we're on to the next thing, okay? But these people are suffering, are hurting. When I saw a student in the store yesterday, he says, his response to me was, uh, Mr. Tatro, everybody's alive. I said, that's great. I said, he says, yeah, but we lost our house. I lost everything. Every memento I had, every, the house is gone, and my dad works in a hotel, so we're sleeping in the hotel. And then what happens when the hotel says, okay, it's time for us to go back to business? What happens to these people? It, it's, this, is, this sounds strange, but it would seem to me that after World War II, when the Army Corps of Engineers built all this housing for returning vets, we have land around here that they should be coming in and building. I'm not talking about developers that are going to charge $2 million. I'm talking about Army Corps of Engineers that come in and build a two-bedroom, uh, two-bathroom, uh, uh, living room, and a kitchen. And they can all look alike but build it and get these people someplace. FEMA, oh, FEMA. FEMA doesn't operate until you've got your, your insurance taken care of. They'll step in maybe for the differential, but we're now just starting to see uh, the people being allowed to go into different areas. And there's other areas that's gonna be a long time. I asked a, a National Guardsman today, how long do you think you guys will be here? He said, we've been told a year really a year he says yeah and that might be minimal i'm talking about that might be a lot longer than that so i think we eventually have to get to responsibility people are saying well can we learn from this can we learn from this for the future see that's that's what i always get ticked off about because we'll we'll, we'll learn from this for the future in other words let's forget about right now in the next week or two let's deal with what's going to happen on the next one that goes well we'll get better at it like that i'm worried about the th i'm worried about my students and their families and their parents where they go to school they they suffered through a couple years of covid and and now this I mean, it's just, it's, it's heartbreaking. It's just, and, and if you don't feel it, I'm sorry. And if I haven't conveyed it, then shame on me. If it hadn't been for the volunteers, for let's call them the locals, and a few tourists got involved, not many, but uh, why would they? They want to get off this island. But the people who in upcountry and people who were not basically affected, directly affected by the fire, have been incredible, have been absolutely incredible. Um, setting up and looking for uh, contributions and, and to be able to get food to people to come to the center. Back in Lahaina, the water's not turned on yet. Um, and the question becomes, with the heat of the fire, uh, did it impact the lines that the water's going through? Up, up here in, in Kula, in this area, where there's significant fires, uh, the same thing. You can't use the water. We got water, but you can't use it. You can't, uh, you're not supposed to bathe in it. I do. You can't uh, drink it. So bottled water is important, and it's being supplied. Um, some of the things, I think uh, Costco and some of the others, there's been a big distribution of water. Um, it's, it's great. Food, uh, food is, is there. They make food, uh, lunches and dinners and breakfasts and things like that. And the food is being provided. You, um, back in Lahaina, there's a big distribution area where you go through, tell them how many um, adults or children, how many people in the family. They'll try to give food accordingly. Um, some produce, uh, maybe some burger, some, some things, um, enough to sustain a family for a couple days and then have to go back. How long is that going to last? Um, again, the, 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 the government uh, has, to me, been absolutely, uh, not only the, the federal, but the, the state has been absolutely uh, non-existent. Had it not been for the locals, had it not been for these people who are working morning, afternoon, night, then people would be starving. People would be without water. And it, it's, so we've seen, we've seen uh, an increase, or I should say, we've seen the, the, the National Guard come in who are directing people. For a while, they were keeping boats from running uh, supplies here uh, from other islands. They were stopping them. Uh, there was uh, a, a supposedly uh, an in, the, the insulin was being brought in, and the state stopped it. 
they said, no, you can't bring that in. Uh, you know, it has to be done a different way. And people needed that type of thing. It's, it's like at this moment in time, and my son and talking to him today said the one thing, he says, there is no leader. There's nobody stepping up that's saying and taking control and saying, this is what we're gonna do to help the people, to help the people. It's like, what looks good on that, that five o'clock newscast? What looks good for my next election? That's, that's what the feeling is. And that's what's being going through uh, the people. The people feel that they've been abandoned. And um, I, I might have said this earlier, I don't know. I applied for my $1,000 from United Way and I still haven't heard a word from them. And uh, no, uh, my teacher's union, great, stepped up, um, got me some money, that's, that's terrific. I know that at the Hyatt, the Hyatt Regency, they are putting together uh, money. Yeah, the, the board, who's the owners of the Hyatt Regency, the various timeshares there, they're working to bring money to, to provide to the employees of uh, the Hyatt. I know that at Mala, Mala Wharf down there, the, the guys who own that, they're working to put money together for the employees of that and just give kudos and applause to the people who are continuing. Question becomes, how long can they do it? This is not going to be over. The real disaster has just begun. It's just begun.